you see an animal that was preconditioned with brief periods of ischemia and reperfusion. Now within that ischemic risk zone, you see a lot of red, that is a lot of viable myocardium and small islands or peninsulas of necrotic tissue which appear as white. So these brief periods of ischemia precondition the heart and markedly reduce the size of the infarction. This phenomenon was first described by Murray, Jennings, and Reimer in 1986 in a canine model of coronary occlusion. And here you can see that uh, infarct size was markedly reduced by ischemic preconditioning. And importantly, this was not due to recruitment of coronary collateral of flow because there was no difference in collateral flow uh, within the ischemic risk zone. This is just a higher power view of those slides, again, showing the mark reduction in infarct size with ischemic preconditioning. Is there clinical evidence for preconditioning? Yes, there is. One is the observation of less chest pain, less ST segment elevation, and less lactate production with subsequent compared to a first angioplasty balloon inflation. In addition, there's been descriptions of reduction of infarct size, mortality, and heart failure in patients who have histories of angina prior to their acute MI. I suspect many of you are familiar with acute tolerance to angina, or the so-called warm-up phenomena, where patients warm up with exertion and then can tolerate angina. There's also been studies performed on human cardiac tissue showing preconditioning-like phenomena looking at ATP levels during cabbage uh, and looking at in vitro studies in isolated human muscle and in vitro studies on human myocytes, which have mimicked preconditioning and shown a benefit of that in in vitro uh, experiments. This is data from a study that we did with the Timmy group from uh, Brownwald's group in, in Boston. This was a TIMI-4 study, and we were looking at uh, myocardial infarct size assessed by total CK units in patients who had histories of angina prior to infarction and those who did not have histories of angina. And you can see that myocardial infarct size was lower in those patients who had histories of angina, and there were also significant reductions of in-hospital death, severe heart failure, and shock, and the combination of death and severe heart failure and shock and those patients who had histories of prior angina shown in green versus those who did not have angina shown in blue. Now the problem with ischemic preconditioning is that it's hard to really use that as a treatment, at least for acute myocardial infarction, because we don't know when patients are going to have their infarcts. But there are other ways of conditioning the myocardium, and one is called remote ischemic preconditioning or ischemic conditioning at a distance that might be more clinically relevant. This refers to the situation in which ischemic conditioning of one vascular bed may protect a remote vascular bed, and this could occur within the same organ or between different organs. The first study to actually show this existed was a study done by Prischklenk, Bauer, Ovis, myself, and Whitaker published in 1993. Regional ischemic preconditioning protected remote virgin myocardium from subsequent sustained coronary occlusion. In this study, preconditioning the circumflex coronary artery bed reduced infarct size when the left anterior descending artery bed was occluded for 60 minutes followed by reperfusion. And it showed that brief episodes of ischemia in one vascular bed protect remote virgin myocardium from subsequent sustained coronary artery occlusion in the canine model. And this is the data from Dr. Karen Chickling's study. Uh, the top panel here looks at the area at risk over the left ventricle, the area of necrosis over the left ventricle, the area of necrosis as a percentage of the risk zone, which is really infarct size, and control animals in the open, open bars, and animals that were preconditioned with brief circumflex occlusions and reperfusions prior to a more prolonged left anterior descending artery occlusion. And this showed that infarct size was markedly reduced uh, by preconditioning. And if one plots coronary collateral flow in the endocardium, endocardial regional myocardial blood flow, and the control group versus the preconditioned group for any given level of uh, collateral blood flow, the infarcts are smaller uh, in the conditioned animals. 
Ischemic preconditioning at a distance has also been described. This is one of the first studies that did this. It was by Birnbaum in our lab. And basically what he did is created coronary occlusions in rabbits. But before that, he induced a partial stenosis of the femoral arteries and then rapid stimulation of the ga gastric nemus muscle in the rabbit to induce limb ischemia. And limb ischemia prior to coronary artery occlusion also significantly reduced myocardial infarct size so that remote ischemia of a skeletal muscle could precondition the myocardium. What are the mechanisms of this remote ischemia concept? Well, the mechanisms are still under investigation, but there's certainly a stimulus. It could be four cycles of five minutes of limb ischemia and five minutes of reperfusion, which then lead to, it is thought, systemic release of circulating preconditioning substances. Other studies suggest that uh, neuronal reflexes may be important, but the humoral concept is pretty interesting. And studies have shown that if you take the venous effluent of a preconditioned um, remote muscle, let's say, and then give that venous effluent to a infarct model, you can reduce infarct size. So it's thought that some humoral substance may be important, working on a receptor, which may affect intracellular kinase pathways or the mitochondria. Um, and this leads then to protection with decreases of neutrophil pro-inflammatory gene expression and adhesion, decreased myocardial infarct size, and improved cardiac function, reduced ischemic pain, and evidence of multi-organ protection during cardiac and non-cardiac uh, surgery in some of the studies. One of the first studies that showed that remote ischemic conditioning could be applied to patients with acute myocardial infarction was this classic study by Botker and coworkers. Uh, they looked at 333 patients with, an, with a first acute myocardial infarction, randomized to a primary PCI with or without remote conditioning, which consisted of four cycles of five minutes of brachial artery cuff inflation and five minutes of deflation begun in the ambulance. And then they looked at median salvage index by nuclear studies, looking at myocardial perfusion imaging, it was 0.75, the salvage index and remote conditioning group, which was significantly better than the control group of 0.55. And they concluded that remote ischemic conditioning before hospital admission increases myocardial salvage and is safe. And in their study, they plotted the area at risk on the horizontal axis and the final infarct size on the vertical axis. And you can see that in the patients who received remote conditioning, in blue, for any risk zone, there was a smaller infarct size compared to the control group. The same investigators then carried their study out and looked at these patients long term. In this patient, paper by Sloth, uh, they looked at these patients um, out long term. And they found that the primary endpoint of major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events composite of all-cause mortality, MI, readmission for heart failure, ischemic stroke, transient attack, were significantly lower uh, at 3.8 years follow-up. Uh, so MACE was reduced, all-cause mortality was reduced, and there were trends in the right direction for reducing um, uh, additional MI and readmission for heart failure and ischemic stroke or transient ischemic stroke. Now, if one goes on clinicaltrials.gov and searches for ischemic preconditioning, many studies come up. And uh, this is one of the more recent uh, analysis in which 220 studies were found for ischemic preconditioning. And these are being done all around the world. Uh, there's a lot of them being done in Europe, some being done in the, in the US and also in Asia and Canada as well and then scattered in other continents. So there's a lot of interest in applying ischemic conditioning to various conditions. Um, 227 RIPC remote ischemic preconditioning studies listed at clinicaltrials.gov as of 12-8-16. These studies are aimed at investigating the use of remote ischemic preconditioning for various conditions in addition to myocardial infarction 
including things like kidney transplantation, angiopathy and diabetes, and intracranial atherosclerosis, and also endothelial dysfunction, which uh, Dr. Nagavi is going to go into in more detail during the second half of this uh, uh, presentation. Now, this slide is uh, taken from a review by Sharma et al., published in 2015, a remote ischemic conditioning and acute MI. And this shows uh, studies that have been done to look at remote conditioning for MI. There's about five of them listed here. And these studies all were positive in terms of showing some benefit of remote conditioning on infarct size assessed by um, enzymes, MACE, um, and there was also a study looking at a reduction of incidence of contrast-induced acute kidney injury. This is uh, a slide from the same paper looking at clinical trials exploring the benefits of remote conditioning in patients undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting. Now here the data are a bit more mixed, and there have been some studies showing reductions in enzymatic uh, infarction associated with the uh, with, uh, with the procedures, but some studies have been negative. Um, and I think that part of the reason that some of the cabbage studies have been negative is you've got to remember these hearts are protected to begin with. So these patients are getting cardioplegia. These hearts are getting hypothermia in many cases. These patients are getting anesthetic agents, some of which are actually been shown to be uh, cardioprotective. So the cabbage data has been much more mixed and with a couple of very recent negative trials uh, in, uh, in major journals. This is a, a slide that's taken from LePage, a meta-analysis of remote ischemic conditioning, looking at cardioprotective enzymes. Uh, here you see that uh, a primary PCI for myocardial infarction in general shows reductions of infarct size. Uh, by a CKMB, CKMB area under the curve and a trend for troponin. Um, we see a the elective PCI uh, tends to be a bit more mixed, but the CKMB was uh, actually suggested that control might have been better here. Um, vascular surgery suggests that RIC is better. Um, and then cardiac surgery, as I mentioned, was mixed. Uh, but trends for many of these studies in the right direction for both adults and children. So ischemic conditioning, potential applications, these include reduction of myocardial infarct size, possibly reducing cardiac damage during PCI, although again very mixed, especially for elective PCIs, protecting the myocardium during coronary bypass grafting, again mixed data, protecting the vasculature during vascular surgery procedures, possibly unstable angina, in the future before activities that reproducibly cause angina in patients with stable angina, protecting donor hearts before excision and transport, and protecting other organs including brain and kidney during episodes of ischemia. Now I now want to just spend a little bit on some of the recent studies that have looked at neuro, uh, neurologic damage and uh, the potential of remote conditioning. Uh, this is a study that was done in rats. Uh, adult Worcester male rats underwent remote preconditioning or sham surgery. Then they had two hours of middle cerebral artery occlusion. Those having middle cerebral artery occlusion 24 hours after RIPC had significantly smaller cerebral infarct volumes versus controls and better neurologic scores. Interestingly, ganglion blocker, hexamethonium, blocked the benefit in this study. Here's another study in looking at uh, uh, patients this time. This is upper limb ischemic preconditioning prevents recurrent stroke and intracranial arterial stenosis. 68 cases of patients with symptomatic atherosclerotic arterial stenosis. They had bilateral arm ischemic conditioning. Um, which was five brief bilateral upper limb ischemia followed by reperfusion twice a day for over 300 days. The incidence of recurrent stroke at 90 and 300 days were 23 and 26 percent respectively in untreated control groups versus 5 and 7.9 percent respectively in the preconditioned group, P less than 0 
and uh, spec measure of cerebral flow showed improvements in the preconditioning patients. This is a schema conditioning is safe and effective for octo and nonogenarians in stroke prevention and treatment, paper by Mangan coworkers. They looked at the effectiveness of bilateral arm ischemic preconditioning and reducing stroke recurrence in elderly patients. 58 patients with symptomatic intracranial arterial stenosis were randomized to conditioning uh, versus sham. They measured various inflammatory markers at 180 days. Uh, there were two infarcts and seven TIAs in the conditioning group versus eight infarctions and 11 TIAs in the sham group. Uh, this is a study called remote ischemic preconditioning, perconditioning as an adjunct therapy to thrombolysis in patients with acute ischemic stroke, a randomized trial. Uh, 443 patients with suspected acute stroke. They got alteplase. They had MRIs at 24 hours in one month. The primary endpoint was penumbral salvage, volume of the perfusion-diffusion mismatch, not progressing to infarction after one month. And after adjustment for baseline perfusion and diffusion lesion severity, voxel-wise analysis showed that remote conditioning reduced tissue risk of infarction. And that was highly significant. This is a study that's interesting. Um, Remote ischemic post-conditioning, harnessing endogenous protection in a murine model of vascular cognitive impairment. This group previously reported that remote ischemic conditioning during acute stroke conferred cardioprotection and increased cerebral blood flow. They tested whether remote conditioning could augment cerebral blood flow and prevent cognitive impairment um, in a bilateral common carotid artery stenosis mouse model. Uh, bilateral carotid artery stenosis was induced with customized microcoils and male mice to establish chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, which creates a model of vascular cognitive impairment. One week after surgery, mice treated with remote ischemic post-conditioning um, had this once daily for two weeks, so they did, then did cognitive testing at four weeks. The results, remote ischemic post-conditioning improved cognitive function inhibited inflammatory responses and prevented cell death, decreased accumulation of amyloid beta protein, and protected white matter integrity. And just very quickly, the slide at the upper left here, or the panel at the upper left shows um, perfusion. Perfusion, increased perfusion is shown in red. So here is um, a control group here pre in day 14, day 28, you see these areas of per perfusion in yellow. And you compare that to remote conditioning, which at day uh, 14 and 28 had much better perfusion. Uh, that's shown graph, uh, quantitatively on the right graph here, where at day 28 and day 14, uh, the conditioning group in green had better perfusion. They also had better exploration time and uh, better discrimination index, which are cognitive function tests that are done in these mice. So conditioning seemed to improve that. Uh, this shows beta amyloid accumulation, showing that it was reduced in the conditioning group compared to the control group. I think that can be seen uh, quite here, well here in the hippocampus. Here's sham. Uh, here's uh, bilateral carotid artery stenosis showing beta amyloid accumulation in brown. And then with treatment, you see much less of this. So there is many potential clinical applications for ischemic conditioning. Um, this includes uh, heart attack and myocardial infarction and heart failure, sports performance, which we didn't get into, but there are data showing that remote ischemic conditioning can enhance exercise. And we did one study. Uh, uh, with some collaborators in Texas showing that uh, you could actually improve aspects of bicycle performance with remote conditioning. Possibly pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, major surgeries in high-risk patients, enhancements of circulating stem cells, stroke, organ procurement for transplantation. Hypertension, this is an area that uh, Dr. Nagavi and I are very interested in and also relates to improvement of endothelial function with remote conditioning. 
kidney protection, anastomotic leakage, and peripheral arterial disease. These are all some of the potential clinical applications for conditioning. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Nagavi, who is going to focus a little bit more on some other aspects of it, including endothelial dysfunction. Thank you, Dr. Kohner. Thank you so much for a very uh, well thought out presentation on the concept, the underlying dynamics of endothelial of uh, the ischemic conditioning and its effect on various organs. Here, as Dr. Kohner said, and I initially uh, outlined, my goal is to zoom in on the applications of ischemic conditioning for improving endothelial function and vascular function overall. I have to uh, disclose that I am the uh, inventor of a number of technologies that came out of my laboratories uh, from years ago back at Texas Heart Institute, and I continued those uh, under endothelix and uh, ischemic conditioning therapeutics and Meditex, so that's for disclosure. Um, I also have to tell you that we've had uh, a number of these events from prior years that uh, aimed at shedding light on the whole area of uh, ischemic conditioning and endothelial function and their cross uh, connections. Now we have much more granularity than when, uh, than when we did when we started to steal as Dr. Cloner mentioned, we have a number of uh, uh, major trials, trials with uh, four or 5,000 patients undergoing that are going to address a number of things that are listed here. Surprisingly, the slide deck that Dr. Cloner ended his presentation with potential applications of uh, ischemic conditioning overlaps almost entirely with the slide, slide that I have here, um, I hope you all can see, and that is really endothelial dysfunction is a very diverse, a very widespread um, mi microvascular disease, and it affects all of these organs and conditions that you can see here. So if that's the case, then the notion of bringing endothelial uh, remote ischemic conditioning to endothelial dysfunction is just uh, almost a no-brainer. Uh, Dr. Cloner mentioned a number of the studies that are going and um, have uh, concluded that are uh, uh, significant in terms of uh, ischemic conditioning on coronary artery disease acute events like Dr. Botker's study that showed remote ischemic conditioning in ambulance reduced cardiac damage in patients. He followed uh, by looking at their myocardial perfusion. He followed by looking at their outcomes. Uh, that was a 300 patient study. I know that he's working on a major lar a larger study like around 2,000 patient. So uh, that's one example. I know there are uh, a number of studies on the stroke, uh, also studies. The only study that uh, Dr. Cloner uh, mentioned that came out negative and has a lot of questions, and that was for preoperative or surgery application of ischemic conditioning. And as Dr. Cloner mentioned, all of those bypass patients already ischemic conditioned a number of ways uh, uh, medically by uh, using certain drugs that cause uh, a, a replicate of ischemic conditioning effect uh, all the way by actual physical ischemic conditioning. So that's uh, one reason. But my focus, as I said, is on endothelial dysfunction. And I hope at the end I can convince you that ischemic conditioning can be uh, a method of choice for low, for improving endothelial dysfunction and lowering blood pressure. Lowering blood pressure and treating hypertension is my focus. I'm going to go over briefly on my uh, uh, 
background that uh, you know, I was obsessed about evaluating non-invasively after being obsessed evaluating invasively uh, in my prior uh, career in uh, life on vulnerable plaques and detecting plaques by inserting catheter into coronary, I was focusing on finding a way to do it non-invasively. And as you can see here, we have a very extensive network of vasculature. They're all the same in terms of being covered by the epithelial cell. They have an intermediate layer of the smooth muscle cell and the outer layer of adventitia. And this is the same story in the heart, in the lungs, liver, limbs, anywhere you look at, wherever there is, there is blood circulation, you will have the same anatomy. And out of this anatomy of the three layers of the vessel wall, endothelial layer is considered the most important critical one. You can consider it the brain of the artery. So, and pioneers in endothelial function were there years before I even got into this field and published really the same thing that I'm telling you, that endothelial function is indeed a barometer of cardiovascular risk. These are not my research, but abundance of research out there that uh, are telling us that endothelial function is indeed a barometer. It is affected by all these risk factors that are on this side and protective factors on this side. And basically what you see is the net effect of the negative effect and the positive effect on this endothelial uh, cell. One key factor for uh, paying more attention to endothelial function than we uh, have is that it is really the only marker, biomarker, that is reversible, that is uh, uh, dynamic. Whereas if you look at the thickening of the artery uh, measured by carotid intermedial thickness or by measuring the thickness of the wall of the coronary, they're not going back, especially coronary calcification. They just stay there and they become calcified and fibrotic. But, uh, endothelial dysfunction is responsive to therapy and uh, can change. There is a, a nice video on endothelic uh, website which I consider uh, like a, writing a, a review article but instead of reading 20 pages you can uh, learn about that by watch, watching this video. This video essentially ends in the technology that uh, my group developed. Uh, it combines measurement of uh, vascular reactivity, typical vascular reactivity, which is the arm cuff inflated for five minutes, deflated for five minutes, and the traditional way was putting an ultrasound here on the brachial artery to measure the dilation in response to the cup occlusion and release, measuring it by basically a simple thermometer. And the thermometer automatically through a software measures changes in the blood flow as reflected in temperature during a five minute cup occlusion and release and it shows the response or report in an automated way. As I was or I have spent almost a decade, over a decade on this in uh, fine tuning algorithms and developing all these details that are required for a test to be fully uh, validated an operator independent, I've been consistently thinking about, so what? How do we treat endothelial dysfunction? What do we do about once we know uh, a Vendis report is poor? Uh, yes, we can tell them the same thing that we uh, generally tell our patients, that they need uh, to take their medications because a lot of them don't or they don't take it seriously because the blood pressure is vacillating, their cholesterol is borderline. So having a marker of endothelial function would be great. Um, also you can tell their physician to up their dose uh, if they're taking their medication in a sort of elementary level. 
Uh, so you can do some mm, good by knowing in the theory of this function, but my quest in that path was uh, what can we do to uh, enhance the field beyond uh, uh, exaggerating treatment, existing treatment, and uh, amplifying or uh, uh, prescribing multiple medications. These are things that are in our arsenal of therapy for a patient with uh, uh, persistent endothelial dysfunction. But I wanted to go beyond that, so ischemic conditioning really came out handy. It amazingly uh, uses the same method, a cuff, so you can imagine the same cuff that is inflated around the arm to create vascular reactivity and measure it by uh, the temperature digital thermal monitoring using the Vendor Sabai could be used for inducing ischemic conditions. So that was my entry to this. As Dr. Koloner alluded to, and uh, published by a number of researchers, including uh, by Hans um, Botker, uh, there is a very distinct pattern involved in, uh, in the ischemic conditioning, where you, when you do the ischemic conditioning in the arm, you use the distal part, which is ischemic, to produce certain mediators, compound, uh, which is a milieu of uh, uh, multiple things we really can't point. I mean, I know some people are trying to say there is one factor or X factor, but chances are it's multiple factors and they affect uh, predominantly, they affect quite a few places, but they affect predominantly in the cellular uh, cells in intracellular uh, mitochondrial uh, metabolism and cause uh, both uh, immediate and delayed effect. The delayed effect is something that uh, I'll show you in a, in a little bit. It's amazing that uh, ischemic condition can have an immediate effect through one pathway and a delayed effect through another pathway. At the end of my presentation, I'm hoping to uh, conclude and bring to your attention that ischemic conditioning really is not nothing weird or very strange, especially if you do it on your arm and do a couple minutes, five minutes occlusion, the pain, pressure, ischemia uh, makes you feel like this is totally uh, uh, non-physiologic. I argue here that we do ischemic conditioning on daily basis. Exercise is a form, a natural form of ischemic condition. As you can see in this picture of, of intense exercise, you do a very fast uh, burning uh, physical activity. Then you take a break. During break, you have repair fusion. Blood comes in sometimes, or most of the time, the flow, the amount of blood that comes is significantly more than what it was in the resting situation. As you know, we call this reactive hypremia. So you, you get ischemia, reperfusion, ischemia, reperfusion. That is exactly what we create with these protocols. So ischemic conditioning is another form of exercise. And when you look at the outcome and the effect of exercise on endothelial function, improving endothelial function, reducing blood pressure, they talk very, very similar. So let's go through a few slides and studies that I've mentioned to uh, bring to your attention. This was really the, uh, one of the early ones uh, that uh, helped shed light on this, that if you do repetitive ischemic conditioning, in this protocol, uh, a Japanese group uh, reported that they did six times cough occlusion and release. It's like you go on a more intense exercise. And they showed that it increased, and, and they uh, alluded to the two mechanisms, the immediate five minutes um, uh, or, or so right after ischemic conditioning, which is done through protein kinase pathways and um, uh, potassium channels and so on, and immediate free radical effects. And about 24 hours later, where it's uh, mostly affected uh, through 
enhancement of protein uh, production of EDOS, uh, nitric oxide synthase pathway, and other enzymes that require new creation of protein intracellular. So they showed that actually uh, as you increase, this is for those people who are familiar with response to acetylcholine in measuring uh, blood flow, a forearm blood flow, SPF, uh, that you show that those people who received preconditioning were the only one out of these that received uh, a significant uh, enhancement in their response to acetylcholine. They also showed that uh, the preconditioning group, uh, both in the preconditioned arm and control lateral when you uh, draw blood, they had a significant increase in progenitor cells. We all know progenitor cells, endothelial progenitor cells are key in vascular repair and in endothelial function. So correlation between the ma maximum blood flow in response to acetylcholine and endothelial progenitor cell was uh, shown by this group. Then you have the 2011 paper that showed effect of local and remote ischemic conditioning on endothelial function in young people and healthy people. So they took young people, average 28-year-old, and healthy uh, older people, average 70 um, or so, and then hypertensive patients uh, the same way, about 70 years old. So you have a young, healthy group and uh, adult, uh, uh, elderly healthy group, and then elderly hypertensive. And they showed that when you, between these three groups, uh, when you do ischemia, the four, they're, you know, within the same sort of cluster of their uh, age group, but after ischemic conditioning, there is a significant uh, increase. And this increase in, 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 in flow-mediated dilatation is consistent across all three groups, the young group, the healthy, and healthy, healthy elderly and hypertensive elderly. And you can see here that this, be, this baseline FMD, obviously young healthy group would have a, a high baseline FMD, we know that. Then you go to the healthy elderly, we know that they have a much uh, lower FMD comparing to the healthy young. And then we know that hypertensive uh, elderly has even significantly lower uh, FMD. Again, this is flow-mediated dilatation, the ultrasound base. Uh, this is baseline in hypertensive people, 6.3. Elderly, but not hypertensive, 8.1. Adult, uh, young, 13.7. Now, follow them post ischemic conditioning in the same arm, so it says local ischemic conditioning is in the same arm measure, a huge increase in FMD in the young group. So ischemic conditioning here improving in the filial function in the young group 100% almost here. Well, that's not limited to the young group. You look at this group, the healthy elderly group, ischemic conditioning in the same arm doubled it from 8.1 to 16.8. And the same thing, even more possibly, yes, in fact, it's more, a little more, in the hypertensive elderly group, from 6.3 went to 12.3. That's literally 200% uh, or 100% increase in this group after uh, uh, local ischemic conditioning. This one is the other side. So they did the ischemic conditioning in the right arm and they measured in the left arm. They measured the endothelial function in the left arm. Look, the left arm had almost a 70% increase in the young people, uh, about 60% or so in the uh, healthy elderly people, and uh, also the same way about 50 the 60% increase in the hypertensive. I, I find this study fascinating. This is the illustrated version of that. Young, uh, healthy, <clears throat> and hypertensive. Uh, you will see this uh, slide illustrates that uh, separation. 
mean baseline FMD, post local to measure the same arm in the filial function in the, in the other side. And this is the group that is our focus. Our, our focus. These are groups that are uh, hypertensive and have low endothelial dysfunction. So you will see that more um, uh, towards the end of this. So they concluded, and so you were thinking that this is just one study. Well, this is another study. They did seven days of remote ischemic preconditioning, and they looked at both local and distal effects and concluded that the effect even lasted after a week, which is quite uh, interesting. And the effect, it was not just on endothelial function, it was on endothelial function and blood pressure. So it improved blood pressure and lower, uh, uh, it improved endothelial function and lowered blood pressure. So here it shows pre ischemic conditioning, post, there is an increase, and post after eight days, which is even more important. So both forearm flow and FMD which are both indicators of endothelial function. Here is where I was uh, uh, most interested to share with you. Mean arterial blood pressure in the intervention arm, the same arm that you measure, before ischemic conditioning is 93. Remember, this is mean arterial blood pressure. So systolic plus 2 diastolic divided by 3, so it's diluted. But you can still see there is a significant reduction between pre and post, and the p-value is significant. Uh, the same thing for flow. So, and, and as you can see, they were not very, uh, uh, very high uh, uh, level of blood pressure. They, they were very hypertensive. So, the effect is even more impressive when you see it at this level. So, I'd like to, uh, towards the end of this presentation, wrap up that we are not dealing with a system or a, a, a drug that is well studied and it's, everything is clear and you just give them a simple dose um, or you don't titrate the dose um, and here that the, the drug is ischemia so the dose of ischemia. We don't know a lot about the interaction with other diseases and other risk factors and this uh, is an excellent uh, publication uh, that uh, sheds light on the importance of looking at what other conditions these people are uh, dealing with. And with regard to the uh, negative trial, uh, this study uh, paper is a really good one, uh, bringing to our attention that there are many challenges to translate a preclinical uh, data at animal level to human level in early clinical stage and from early clinical stage is phase one, phase two, to a, a late stage phase three trial. So it's not an easy job, and there are a number of things that needs to be uh, that, that we need to pay attention to in order to uh, realize the dream and the potential that uh, ischemic conditioning has given to cardiovascular researchers. So. Uh, one item I want to emphasize on, and that is ischemic conditioning is based on ischemia. If there was no ischemia, there wouldn't be any ischemic condition. So it makes sense that we pay attention to a dosing ischemia and making sure everybody gets an adequate dose of ischemia. And this was a study done in my lab years ago that showed out of um, the office of staff and people were working with me, uh, female, male, uh, <clears throat> relatively overweight, very lean, you will see a significant difference in the response to a five minute cup occlusion. The lean, young, hyperactive person drops oxygen very quickly and goes to ischemia rapidly. Uh, the female out of these uh, slowly develops ischemia and reached the hypoxia level uh, which is, this is tissue oxygenation index. You have to reach at least 50% to go to the hypoxia level. So <clears throat> we have problem by just giving everybody five minutes and expecting everyone gets the same level of ischemia. And this is an area we have to 
pay attention to when we're working on. So I'm coming back to Dr. Cloner's uh, slide. Uh, I don't have the slide that we uh, presented one of our previous seminars four or five years ago, which this number was uh, 50 something. And now this number is 220 something. That, that means a significant amount of uh, increased attention and interest into studies of uh, uh, remote ischemic conditioning and whatever else it uh, can uh, do besides cardiovascular because there are surgery, there are uh, plastic surgery in other areas in addition to athletic conditioning which is a very uh, hot uh, area in ischemic conditioning. So, and this is worldwide. I just came back from China, a huge amount of interest, uh, very distinguished researchers uh, there that Dr. Cloner and I are uh, collaborating, is starting to collaborate for a very large trial or trials uh, um, studying the effects of ischemic conditioning on uh, lowering blood pressure. This is sort of an outline where we can look at the long-term effect of ischemic conditioning on <clears throat> by repeated uh, therapy and hypertension and other vascular diseases and short term, which is like the study that Dr. Uh, Bosker is doing. This is sort of a, a dream uh, machine that replicates the physiological cardiovascular effect of exercise. Uh, this is what I'm working on with Dr. Cloner uh, in the clinical trial level. But the concept is I'm going to try to show you this uh, video uh, to replicate the effects of ischemic conditioning in um, shear stress or exercise by combining uh, remote ischemic conditioning and uh, external counter pulsation which replicates the effect of exercise. Basically remote ischemic conditioning creates ischemia, reperfusion and you go back to a, a, a pulsated cough to create a, a significant level of, of, of shear stress by moving the same blood back and forth. So in the interest of time, as uh, we have uh, only five minutes left, uh, I want to summarize that the goal really for us is to bring something to patient care, to primary care, uh, to home, somewhere that patient can do with ischemic conditioning. Ischemic conditioning does not require a doctor. It's an automated device that can be applicable uh, in any situation at home, in clinic, primary care, even wearable. Uh, so th that's the premise that we're looking at, reducing blood pressure with the same device that measures blood pressure. That would sound uh, quite appealing to most of us who dealt with uh, uh, managing hypertension and dealing with people who are uh, uh, somewhat reluctant to take medication and uh, 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 you know follow 100% uh, compliance in that regard. So without uh, uh, dragging this too long, I'd like to uh, summarize our presentation that we had uh, a, a notion of remote ischemic conditioning discovered by Dr. Cloner and his team in his lab years ago. And unfortunately, uh, we're now um, close to uh, 20 years since uh, his team and uh, other pioneers brought this to our attention. We haven't turned it to patient care. It's uh, really a duty for us if there is science, if there is uh, proven uh, efficacy to try to bring this to patient care. And we hope that we can, uh, with some of you who are physicians or researchers, uh, collaborate to bring this to the next level. The trial that we uh, are about to embark is uh, a major trial on, uh, will be a major trial on lowering blood pressure in, in borderline hypertensive patients. And uh, with that topic, I'd like to go back to Dr. Cloner and ask his uh, uh, insight into how he, even though we don't have really robust longitudinal data and a few cases that I showed are a smaller study, 
how he views uh, treating hypertensive patients with uh, ischemic condition. Bob? Well, thank you, more for that really nice overview. Um, we know that uh, even in the United States here, where we've got something like 76 million individuals with high blood pressure, the control rates aren't, you know, although they've gotten better, they're not where we want them. Um, and some patients, you know, just have trouble with some of the medicines. We have compliance issues with some of the medicines. I think that the possibility of remote ischemic conditioning could give us another uh, weapon in our armamentarium against hypertension. Uh, there's not that many studies in the literature on it, so I mean there's a lot that we don't know about it, uh, but it might be that even our IPC a few times a week would work in these patients. We just don't know. And so I'm hoping that uh, with our studies that we're planning on doing, we'll be able to look at patients who are high, have high blood pressure, are not adequately controlled on their medicines, or don't want to take medicines, and are willing to try this approach. That's really a, a hope uh, based on some science, but requires a significant amount of work. Uh, the uh, devices have been developed now. It's time to get to work and uh, make this dream a uh, reality. With that, we're exactly at a uh, one-hour time point that we've allocated for this. Uh, the webinar is uh, uh, recorded and will be broadcasted to uh, many more who uh, were not able to participate. Uh, I'd like to take a pause if there's any question because I'm uh, uh, reluctant to continue after time. Uh, but if there's any question that we uh, didn't see or can't see, uh, please feel free to uh, email us. Uh, Dr. Cloner's uh, email is rcloner. No, no it's, it's just cloner at hmri.org. Cloner at K -L -O, hmri. Yeah, K-L-O-N-E-R at hmri.org. Great. And my email, I have a very short email, N N at vp.org. And so we'll be happy to answer questions. And we continue to have this uh, periodical uh, webinar to raise awareness on this very important topic. And uh, we thank you for participating in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.